My name is Alexander Beiner. I am a writer and the co-founder of Rebel Wisdom and one of the organizers of this fine conference in which many people are talking about psychedelics. The name of my talk is Why We Must Never Talk About Psychedelics. So rather than talk about psychedelics, I'm going to talk about Stranger Things because it's really good. Has anyone seen Stranger Things? Yeah, yeah Stranger Absolutely. Things is great. So uh, we'll come back to that. Um, so <laughs> So the reason I want to talk about Stranger Things is this, this track is called 20th Century Psychedelia. And I think to understand what role psychedelics can play uh, in the 21st century, we have to look back at the role they've played. And I think Stranger, and we have to look back at the stories as well. We have to look at the stories that we're fascinated by right now. And Stranger Things is one of the most popular stories in our culture right now. What I think is interesting about it is if anyone hasn't seen it, it's set in the 80s. It's a very, uh, it's kind of an incredibly nostalgic throwback to 80s films, 80s culture. And what's interesting about it for me is that that nostalgia and that desire to go to the 80s is, I think, in part coming from a space of us not knowing who we are, where we're going, the ground beneath our feet is shifting so fast culturally, we don't know which way is up or down. And in fact, in Stranger Things, the um, excuse me, I'm just going to turn this off. In Stranger Things, there's an entire underworld called the Upside Down. And every season starts with everything's fine. And there's these kids, and they're doing 80s kid stuff. And then this deep, twisted underworld of this of kind of a sci fi underworld comes and takes everything over. And it destroys the sense of normality that everyone was living in. I think that's really been the story for us as a culture over the last, certainly, four years, uh, and probably much longer. I think what we're seeing, and I think a lot of the cutting edge philosophers in the world right now are talking about a meaning crisis, a deep, fundamentally existential crisis, which is a meta-crisis, uh, of which climate change is a, or the climate crisis is a particular symptom, and of which extreme political polarization is a symptom, but underlying it is a deep crisis. And I think that deep crisis means that we're now not living in the happy, optimistic world of the 80s where there was a sense of direction and a sense of we knew what was good, what was evil. You know, Stranger Things, for example, is USSR, USA. It's very clear who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. Now, it's not clear who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And in fact, it feels I think for myself certainly, and for many of us, that we're living in a very corrupt world. And that brings me to another story or type of story which is very popular right now, which is the noir story. Noir was really popularized by authors like Raymond Chandler. And in a noir story, what you have is a detective who is the only person in the story who has any integrity. And they're trying to solve a mystery, usually in service of someone with some bit of innocence in them, or sometimes for a femme fatale, who has got some kind of pull of the, the Jungian anima, the divine feminine that's kind of pulling this detective through this corrupt world in search of really a holy grail. It's a, it's a chivalric story, a noir story. Something in the, all the corruption, in a world where the police are corrupt, the judges are corrupt, where no one can be trusted, there's this drive towards something that will make sense of everything and some sublime that will transform all the filth into gold. Now, that is the backdrop of much of the cultural conversation we've been following at Rebel Wisdom for the last uh, 18 months or so. We're a media channel and retreats organization and we interview rebellious thinkers. And a lot of the thinkers we've interviewed have been pointing to this meaning crisis we're experiencing and pointing to, for example, the information ecology, the world we're living in, in which social media is a big source of our news, in which deep fakes, I mean, it's actually kind of impossible to tell whether a video is actually a person speaking or an AI version of that person. We're living in this, the ultimate kind of uh, postmodern hell in some ways. Uh, we interviewed Eric Davis recently and he said we're living through a banal apocalypse which I think is a really horribly <laughs> apt phrase. Um, and I wanted to, in this talk, draw on some of the wisdom of the people we've interviewed and explore, even though we shouldn't talk about them, 
explore how psychedelics might relate to a way through. So I mentioned postmodernity, and I think one of the aspects of postmodernism is that instead of a single grand narrative that unites everyone, which used to be played uh, by religion primarily, the world is comprised of many, many small narratives. Everyone has a story, and everyone's story fills into this kind of interweaving of reality. But there's no up or down, necessarily. A social media is a brilliant place to look for that. And it creates hyper, a hyper-relativistic environment, and it creates extreme narcissism. And uh, philosopher Ken Wilber, uh, who I rate very highly, has, has called it an aperspectival madness because there is no clear direction to see where is truth. truth is rel if truth is relative and there's no such thing as a foundational truth, his argument is that it creates this narcissistic reality in which everyone's truth is equally valid, which it is not, unfortunately. We all have a valid perspective to bring, but unless there is something that is called truth, that we can agree on as a community that is true, we are royally screwed. So, how does that work? How do we find truth together? Well, one of the aspects of postmodernism is that we have all these interwoven stories, and I think it's really important to look at stories and look at what stories bind us and what stories can bind us, especially as a community, because we are all part of a psychedelic community. And I think psychedelics do have the wonderful aspect of empowering us as individuals, and I'll talk about why that's important as well, but we, we all are also hyper-individualistic sometimes. You know, we're communal, but we're also, um, we also are, let's say, free thinkers, and I think psychedelic communities select for quite free-thinking people often, so it's hard to come together as a community and define, okay, what is the teleology of this community? What's the, what's the agreed value system and truth that we want to strive for? So I think that's important. And it's extra important because the world right now is full of bullshit. And um, this is from uh, a man named Frankfurt who wrote a paper on bullshit. It's been popularized by a thinker called John Verbeke. And bullshit is not the same as lying. So this is like he, does, he goes full academic with, with the term bullshit. Bullshit is about persuading people and not caring about whether you're using the truth to do so. What you care about is that people are persuaded. And that is a very toxic element of the postmodern condition that we live in. And it's also rampant in, psychedelic, in the psychedelic world as well. It's everywhere. There's all sorts of new age bullshit. There's all sorts of other bullshit that we have to wade through to find some kind of truth. And why all this matters, why it matters that we do that, why it matters that we develop some kind of discernment as a community and as individuals is that there's a big shift happening this big shift has been pointed out by another really interesting thinker we've interviewed, Jordan Hall, who's pointed out that we are seeing this massive shift right now away from a broadcast society, a broadcast modality, where, say, in the 1950s, you would sit around the radio, and there was maybe three channels, and someone would broadcast what to think or what was going on, and you would receive that broadcast. And yes, you were some, somewhat of a node in that you would talk about it a bit, but the information was broadcast. Now, we are in a decentralized environment where there's loads of data points, and each of us, in a way, has to be the Bitcoin. We're each a node, and we are each faced with an insane amount of information to parse. And so, in order to parse the amount of information you get, even from scrolling through a Facebook feed for 25 minutes, we need to have this kind of deep, deep discernment and we need to come together in small groups of collective intelligence hubs, let's say. Small groups where we make sense of the world together and are accountable to one another and connect with one another so that, because if we can't make sense of the world, we can't act in the world. And there's no point in action if we can't make sense of it. So we have to start by stepping back, connecting with one another, and making sense of the world in a new way. And he also talks about the story in our bones, that when we do this, we connect to something deeper. We connect to a more liminal space in which we might tap into something that is 
deeper than that whole interwoven web of stories, deeper than our own individual perspective, but something that happens when we come into contact with each other. And there's a deeper truth we can access, some deeper encoded knowing that we access, but only from a really liminal space, a space in between, a space of not knowing, a space where we take a step back and stop trying to make sense and become receptive to what's going on. So, and when we do that, I wanna, I wanna talk about a story that is in our bones. Uh, and that is a story that's told over and over again. We hear it in the, the Gnostic Gospels, for example. It's a story of a world that we can't see properly. A, a story of, well, I'll go to the, the Gnostic Gospels specifically, is the story of Sophia, the goddess, who at the beginning of time leaves the center of the universe and enters the world of matter. And as she does so, she gives birth accidentally to this egoic God, the God of the Old Testament, who arises and makes himself God of the world of matter and says, I'm the God of everything. But he's not. He's only the God of the solid things and, and uh, what we can see and touch. And Sophia says to him, no, you're just, you're not even really real. You're really just a broken reflection of true divinity. But because this is a, a jealous, arrogant God, and for the Gnostics, he was the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, he ignores her. And what he ends up doing is convincing people that the only thing that's real is the world of matter. And instead of being able to create anything new, all he can do is mimic things. So the Gnostics had a really fascinating cosmology where they saw that the ego, this is Jung's take on it, the ego, when disconnected from the self, can't really create anything new, can't create true novelty. It just replicates over and over and over again until we surround ourselves with this weird sort of Disneyland reality where nothing is that, nothing has substance. All the movies start to become shit. All the conversations are a bit crap. And it's kind of the world we're living in now a bit. And it's also the, the premise of one of our uh, most popular cultural stories, The Matrix, where we are living in a world we think is real. And through an experience, we come out of it and realize, oh my God, it's not real. It's Plato's cave as well. It's the story of the, uh, the very beginnings of Western philosophy. This is Parmenides. It's one of the first philosophers we have, pre-Socratic philosopher. And he was gifted logic in a dream by a goddess. And she gifted him logic in order to see through the, the deception of the world, uh, according to Peter Kingsley's reading, to see through the bullshit we spin for ourselves, the delusion that we spin as human beings, that we can't help but spinning. And she talked about, we're stuck there because we don't have the metis, the, the wherewithal, this Greek word for kind of presence and wherewithal. We don't have the metis to see through it, but we have to see through it. And if we can be present and in the moment and really here and really embodied and really human, then we can find our way through that Disneyland reality. So, at this point, I'm gonna do something I promised only minutes ago I wouldn't do, which is talk about psychedelics. So, psychedelics. So, psychedelics are one of the tools that we have, not the only tool. I believe they're one of the tools that we have to tie a lot of this together, to be able to come together uh, as small collective intelligence units to make sense of the world, not relying on the broadcast model anymore, not relying on CNN, if anyone still does, I don't know, I seriously doubt it, uh, to rely on our own sense-making together because they have the capacity to bond us very deeply, they have the capacity to deconstruct what we see and allow us to find a way through it. But they have to be used as they've always been used in a, the context of communitas, in the context of the way that many tribal cultures will use them, that there is a reason for using them and there is a cosmology behind how we use them. They don't, I don't think psychedelics are used very well in that postmodern weaving of stories where everyone's truth is equally valid because then you can have an experience and come back and say oh, I'm the reincarnation of the Buddha or I'm from Lemuria, I'm whatever. You just, there's no boundary, there's no sense of groundedness to say okay how do we contextualize this? And one of the, another reason that psychedelics are so important in this context, I think, is because they are, and this is the reason I call the talk why we must never talk about them, is because they are sacred. Psychedelics are sacred. Uh, 
And there is a long tradition in lots of our religious uh, traditions of not talking about the sacred thing. The Tao that can be spoken above is not the true Tao. And we have it in uh, Judaism as well, that you, know, the, the you, don't, you cannot speak the name of God. Um, and John Ruvecki, who's a brilliant cognitive scientist who we've had on the channel a few times as well, um, who I'd highly recommend, he has talked about sacredness. If you don't want to look at sacredness as a spiritual or transcendent thing, you could also recontextualize it as a sacred thing. It's something that you can come back to. And every time you come back to it, it's generative. It regenerates. And you get something new from it that applies to where you are right now. And he uses the example of Plato's writings are like that. You know, thousands of uh, people publish on Plato every single year. Uh, but Plato's been gone for a very long time. And his writings have stayed the same the whole time. But as you go back to them, they regenerate. So psychedelics have the capacity, if used safely and responsibly, in a context of communitas, community, uh, to really keep regenerating and giving us new ideas. You know, Terence McKenna talked about the importance of medium-sized ideas from the psychedelic experience. Not so big that they're unactionable, not so small that they're silly, but medium-sized ideas. And I think to generate those medium-sized ideas, we need some intentionality around it. We need some context I mentioned and some intentionality. And as well as that, I think it's incumbent on all of us to hold the fragility of the psychedelic community and, and these medicines. Really, really important. I remember uh, the first BC was about 300 of us in the University of Canterbury. And everyone, this is about nine years ago, eight years, nine years ago, I think. And everyone felt like it was everyone coming out of the woodwork. And it was really different. It's, only, it's not that long ago. It was really different. It was a really different feeling of, oh my god, if anyone sees me here, oh, uh, everyone come, like, um, there might be people in this room who were there as well. And it was really special. It's always special. It's special now as well. But it, I, it had a real sense of that like, we were really fringe. And we're still all fringe, but we're less fringe, I think, than ever before. And I think with that can come a complacency and a forgetting of what did happen in the 1960s and 70s and how important it is to keep a responsibility. And that is incumbent on a community. A community enforces boundaries. A community creates responsibility. A community creates a process of accountability with its members. And that's really key. And so some of the aspects of a community I would personally like to be involved with and like to strive for is um, discernment. So I mentioned discernment as being that really critical faculty. It's what the goddess told Parmenides to do way back at the birth of Western philosophy, is to be able to see, to be able to see what's really going on and help each other do that. Responsibility, using the substances safely. Uh, and yeah, having safety is a paramount concern. And uh, sovereignty is a word I really like. Sovereignty often is misinterpreted. And the way I'm using it is sovereignty is being sufficient unto yourself, but simultaneously open-hearted and recognizing that we need each other. So there's a deep paradox, I think, in that we have to do it ourselves, but we don't have to do it alone. And both of those things are true at the same time. But unless we have our own sovereignty, unless we have our own connectedness to ourselves, and we're not relying overly on someone else to tell us what to do or how to think, we can't actually come together in these important ways to start making sense of the world. So uh, integrity is, yeah, I, th I believe the um, Chinese character for integrity is a, pr a picture of a person standing by the picture for word. So a person standing by their word. You know, that's... I think that sums it up pretty nicely. Integrity is integrity. And truth, striving for truth, I think is a really, really important quality right now because we live in a post-truth world. And the last thing we need, I think, is more um, interpretation of interpretation of interpretation of interpretation all the way down into uh, what will, I think, destroy us. Um, so some care and some... Um, valuing of the transformative power of truth, because it is transformative, and also the essential nature of truth in us 
living sane, happy, productive lives. And then the final one is, is wisdom, the cultivation of wisdom. It's really interesting uh, with the people we've had on the channel, particularly Roger Walsh, who's probably the world's expert on wisdom, who is a professor who teaches at UC Davis. Um, and John Verveke as well is also somewhat of an expert on wisdom. They both point out that we don't know how to even approach wisdom in the academic world. You know, it's, we don't know where to go for wisdom in our culture. We know where to go for knowledge, but where do we go for wisdom? And what is wisdom? And what's the difference? Wisdom is different to knowledge. Knowledge is knowing uh, what, and wisdom, you, I think, is in part knowing how. Wisdom is a much deeper sense of beingness in how we know. And I think wisdom is something we need to cultivate. Uh, Roger Walsh also points out that in every culture, because he studied the wisdom traditions all around the world, wisdom is always tied to compassion, always. So you don't have wisdom without compassion alongside it. Wisdom is connected to making the world a better place, to use a trite uh, phrase, but it's true. Wisdom is about caring for others as much as it's about having knowledge for ourselves. And the final thing I want to talk about is um, the power of a community and the power of coming together. It's not just for me, it's not just that we need to do so in order to make sense of the world and for the psychedelic community to be a community that has a real impact on the, the way the world moves and can bring wisdom, say, to the world when it needs it. But it's also because something kind of magical happens when people come together. And, um, I, I know this from being part of and facilitating group work, which I think is another key tool. Um, you know, retreats where you might go for two or three days and really come into connection with one another, really share, really be vulnerable, really expose, is that something really tangible happens when we do that. And uh, actually from the Bible, this is a, one of the rare things I really like from the Bible, is uh, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. I think it's such a beautiful sentiment that when we gather together, we, something happens. There is something you can feel. And um, Jamie Wheel is another person we've had on the channel uh, who is an expert on flow. He talks about Quaker meetings being a really nice example of this, where you, people sit and you only spoke when spoken through, which is beautiful. You know, you let, you kind of let your ego relax and then see what emerges. And I think that's a really important thing. And I think if as a community, we can come together in a way to do that, then we're looking good. And we should, because this is sort of the situation we're in. We're all going to die. Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff used to say, the most important thing to remember is that you and everyone you meet today will soon be dead. And I really think that's important. So there's an urgency and there's an aliveness that comes when we recognize that. Um, and Alan Watts uses this nice example of it is effectively like we are just born and we're plunging straight down to the ground. And we might grasp onto things like a house or a car or whatever, but we're plunging alongside, along with it. So much better to plunge together uh, in tandem. And if we do that, I think we can create something pretty magical in the process. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening.